Europe and Asia have an increasingly symbiotic uh, relationship. In 2013, total EU trade with Asia reached, uh, in euro terms, 1.25 trillion, almost double the value recorded a decade ago, and this represents more than a third of total EU trade. The other side around, uh, the EU accounted for almost 30% of Asian trade last year, far ahead of any other trading partner, including the United States. The EU is also a major investor into Asia and vice versa. Around 20% of EU outward investment goes to Asia, while also 20% of inward investment originates in the region. In other words, the economic situation in Europe today has important consequences for the growth trajectory of Asia. And this is a relationship that will likely only increase in strength in the future. I would therefore like to use uh, my remarks today to discuss developments in Europe as part of the growth equation for Asia. Asian policymakers certainly know best the domestic challenges that face them and the types of solutions that are needed. The European situation is no doubt a complex one, but um, if there is a common factor, it is certainly that during the crisis and the persistence of the crisis, part of it is due to the difficulties in the banking sector, especially the euro area banking sector. The sector is in a phase of downsizing and structural change that will inevitably affect financial intermediation going forward. To think about how this will impact European as well as global growth, I think it is useful to <coughs> start with recalling an ancient Chinese fable. The fable is about the boy who lived at the northern border, the border with the northern tribes, and whose horse one day wandered off into the territory of these northern tribes. Everyone commiserated the boy for his misfortune, but not his father, who was a well-trained Taoist. He said, perhaps this will soon turn out to be a blessing. Then a few months later, the, his horse returned, accompanied by a fine other horse. Everyone congratulated him for his luck, although his father was more sanguine. He remarked, perhaps this will soon turn out to be a curse. The boy quickly became fond of riding the fine new horse, then one day out riding, he badly fell and broke his leg. Again, everyone commiserated him, but once more the father disagreed and said, perhaps this will soon turn out to be a blessing. Soon after, the northern tribes invaded the border regions. All able-bodied young men had to take up arms to fight. Nine out of ten were dying. The boy, of course, could not take up arms. He and his father survived. Well, this fable, <coughs> known as the blessing or curse, is essentially about how the true significance of developments is often not immediately apparent. And now, and how the wise observer therefore pays due attention to unintended consequences, both positive as well as negative. In my view, this describes rather well the situation in the euro area financial sector today. 
The euro area banking sector has suffered a substantial shock that has triggered widespread deleveraging. And on the face of it, this is of course a negative development, it harms economic growth and constrains access to finance. Yet, it is also clear that before the crisis, the European banking system had become unhealthily large. It has to be deleveraged. It was too leveraged, too big relative to the size of national economies, and also perhaps too dominant relative to other sources of finance like capital markets. Thus, the effect of a downsizing banking sector might in fact be a blessing in disguise. That is, a shift towards safer banks and also a shift towards a more balanced financing mix. Yet, we have to be careful that this too does not turn out to create problems again. For example, the transition to a new financing mix may favor some jurisdictions over others, thus reinforcing imbalances. A shift from bank to non-bank financing may create new sources of systemic risk in less transparent sectors. In other words, the challenge for policymakers in Europe today is to capitalize on the potential positives from the situation that has befallen us, while making sure that we do not simply end up creating new problems for the future. Let me begin the discussion on how to achieve that by looking at the current trend towards bank downsizing in the euro area. Financing the real economy in the euro area has historically taken place through banks in Europe. The euro area therefore requires and has a large banking sector. The aggregate balance sheet uh, of banks in Europe compared to GDP stands up to 270%. Let me only mention the comparison with the US where uh, the figure, correspondent figure is 70%. The euro area banking sector, however, expanded even more rapidly in the years before the crisis from already high levels. From the start of expansion in 2005 to its peak in 2012, banks' assets increased by more than 60 basis points of GDP. 60 percentage points of GDP. This was associated with the development of unsustainable bank business models banks simply rely too heavily on debt to finance their lending and that debt depended too much on wholesale uh, market funding and much too little on deposits. The crisis has brought those business models to an end and has triggered structural change in the banking sector. European banks have entered a period of secular deleveraging and restructuring. Banks' balance sheet have declined by more than 20% of GDP in 2013 alone. Loan to deposit ratios have fallen from a peak of 142 in the first quarter of 2008 to 117 at the end of last year and I expect these ratios to continue to fall into this year. Credit growth has, of course, been quite weak during this process. The trend towards downsizing of the banking sector, again, has both positive and negative effects. The negative aspects are mostly of a cyclical nature and relate to the current situation. A deleveraging sector implies lower credit supply, which is problematic for a recovering euro area economy. While the early stages of recoveries do certainly not depend as much on credit as firms tend to draw down their internal funds first, when credit demand picks up it needs to be matched 
by credit supply for a sustainable recovery to take hold. The typical lag between credit growth and the economic cycle is around three to four quarters. And you know that the European economy started growing again uh, around a year ago. We are seeing our also now tentative signs from survey data that credit demand in the euro area is starting to pick up. Our latest uh, bank lending survey which uh, was published in April uh, this year, with figures, of course, further back, shows that net loan demand has turned positive for all loan categories. So we need to make sure that the banking sector is strong enough to meet that demand. A car can run on low fuel for a while, but at some point it needs to fill up. Otherwise, the engine will stall. And this stage of the recovery, it is clear. There needs to be sufficient fuel, meaning credit, to wrap up the engine of the economy. This is one reason why the ECB has been putting so much emphasis on the ongoing comprehensive assessment of banks' balance sheets in the euro area. Our aim is to ensure that banks are sufficiently capitalized to once start again originating loans and taking risk. So far, the mere shadow of this exercise that we are doing it has prompting or has had a catalytic effect on the bank's asset valuations, on their provisioning, and also on their capital raising, which has started uh, around a year ago and is continuing into this exercise. That is not to say that we expect a surge in aggregate credit growth as the exercise now reaches its completion with the publication of the results um, in autumn. Rather, our expectation is that new finance should be available for firms that need it. Let me only give uh, one example. Spain, the banking restructuring program since 2012 has not yet led to an increase in overall credit. But what we see also in Spain is that smaller credit with uh, going up to 1 million, which mainly goes to non-financial corporations and small and medium-sized enterprises, in Spain have shown a notable recovery, at least in the recent months and weeks. Let me now turn to the positive aspects of uh, restructuring and downsizing a banking sector, and those uh, positive aspects are mainly structural in nature. Some research suggests that there is a threshold beyond which the positive effect of finance on growth diminishes. For example, information rents in the financial sector might be generated by complex financial products or opaque banking organization, allowing, well, at least temporarily, for higher salaries and bonuses to be paid. This attracts talented individuals away from more productive sectors. Alternatively, Two large banks may also start expanding into less productive types of lending or certainly more risky areas of lending. If a housing bubble is fueled by aggressive lending, it is often the residential construction industry that initially benefits. But the construction sector is typically characterized by low productivity growth compared to manufacturing. Indeed, the proportion of housing loans as a percentage of total loans in the euro area increased from around 50% in 1990 to more than 70% today, which is the type of lending that tends to be associated with lower growth. Structurally, a smaller banking sector could, at least in theory, 
help to avoid those negative effects on growth and insulate the euro area from some of those risks. And what is certainly true that in some countries um, this uh, hype in lending has induced an oversized construction sector which itself also needs to be downsized. But still, a smaller or downsized banking sector is no guarantee for lower overall risk. And after all, what we are aiming at is not a certain amount or certain ideal size of a banking sector, but what we are aiming at is clearly to de-risk the banking sector. And therefore, business models need to be monitored, uh, risk attitudes, and the profitability of banks also need to be taken into account. And we also have to look uh, into the capacity of banks uh, which have uh, ventured across border in geographical expansion and foreign markets where they might not necessarily have a comparative advantage in domestic knowledge of the market uh, than compared to domestic banks. Another aspect is that a downsized banking sector also provides impetus for capital market developments in Europe. After all, if savings are not being intermediated through banks, they must being be intermediated through capital markets. I see this as a central development <coughs> in Europe towards a more balanced and contested financing mix. Contrary to the trend in most advanced economies, the relative importance of bank versus non-bank financing in the euro area has actually increased in the last two decades from already high levels, and this may have given banks excessive market power. Recent research looking at the pre-crisis period suggests that where banks face limited competition in their domestic markets and firms are more dependent on them, financing constraints for SMEs have been higher. We are at the ECB already seeing signs in the euro area that a rebalancing towards capital market financing is taking place as bank credit to corporates has fallen over the last uh, year. It has been approximately matched by issuance of corporate bonds. It would nonetheless be naive to expect this transition towards a new financing mix to occur seamlessly. <coughs> while on aggregate euro area credit supply might be sufficient to meet credit demand, I see two factors that might lead to an imperfect match between supply and demand for certain firms. Those two factors are one, location, and two, size. Let me address them in turn. In terms of location, the cost of and access to finance in the euro area remains strongly based on national conditions. <coughs> for example, the average cost of borrowing for non-financial firms in a country like Portugal is still more than 5% per year, where the equivalent, for example, for French firms, is only 2% per year. One would imagine in this situation that a Portuguese firm would seek out a French bank. But the euro area banking market does not facilitate such arbitrage. Direct cross-border loans to firms account for just 7.5% of total loans to firms. And local affiliates of foreign banks represent on average only around 20% of national markets and much less in larger countries. Thus, firms depend heavily on the health of their own domestic banking sector. Moreover, while corporate bond issuance has partially substituted for bank lending, it is strongly concentrated in non-distressed countries where there has been no decrease in the net flow of bank loans. The net issuance of debt securities, quoted shares, and bank loans in non-distressed countries was 
plus 66 billion euros in 2013, whereas it was minus 93 billion in the distressed countries. Of course, in principle, firms from distressed countries can issue securities in non-distressed countries. In practice, however, it is legally complicated due to issues of different governing law, especially when securities are traded along a chain of financial intermediaries. This analysis, analysis points to two missing pieces in the euro area financial market. The first is lack of retail banking integration and the second is a lack of capital market integration. The low level of retail banking integration reflects several factors, but diverging approaches to supervision and resolution are certainly among them. For one, the persistence of national borders in the European financial market has in the past created compliance costs and also reduced the synergies of banking integration. A European Commission survey in 2005 found that opaque supervisory approval procedures were a major deterrent to cross-border banking mergers and acquisitions. Moreover, national considerations may have reinforced the fragmentation of retail markets during the crisis. For example, some commentators have argued that supervisors erected de facto internal capital controls within the euro area, and especially among the larger countries, which restricted the flow of funds between banks and within cross-border banks. A similar pattern can be observed in how national authorities in the euro area have dealt with failing banks. In general, non-viable banks were merged with other national banks rather than being wound down or broken up or and sold off. Thus, what could have been an opportunity to excuse me, to increase foreign competition in domestic markets and indeed to work through the crisis more quickly, in some cases ended up in increasing national concentration. To give again a comparison with the US, the FDIC has resolved around 500 banks since 2008, mainly by selling parts of banks to other banks, whereas the equivalent figure for the euro area is around 50. All this suggests that the move towards a genuine banking union in the euro area on which we have embarked could really help create the conditions for deeper retail banking integration. A single supervisory mechanism should lead to harmonization of rules and standards and also remove distortions created by national borders. But beyond the single European supervisor that will start its work as of uh, the um, 4th of November, we also will establish a single resolution mechanism which ensure that banks are resolved from European perspectives and according to least cost principles, which should in principle open the door for cross-border resolution strategies. In this way, even though the banking sector on aggregate is downsizing, credit allocation across the euro area may become more efficient. Banking union is key in ensuring that location becomes a diminishing factor in access to bank finance. But we also need deeper capital market integration. And there we still see that this is being prevented in practice through regulatory heterogeneity across the euro area. We have made some good progress in tackling many issues, but obstacles remain. One is legal uncertainty for cross-border holding and issuance of debt and equity securities. 
Another is differences in national insolvency law which make it difficult for investors to properly evaluate the risk. In other words, building a truly integrated capital market in Europe requires further efforts and new legislating extending beyond what is now foreseen in our banking union. It is essential that this progress that we have made does not cause us to lose reform momentum as from now on. The second element I quickly wanted to mention still is firm size. The effects of location on access to finance are exacerbated by firm size. While firms are in general more credit constraints in some jurisdictions than others, this phenomenon is particularly clear for small and medium-sized companies. There are two reasons for this. First, bank lending to SMEs is concentrated in a hand handful of large banks as only they have the capacity to diversify idiosyncratic risks by lending to a broad enough range of firms. The three biggest originators in each euro area country represent on average 80% of the outstanding amount of the SME loans. This makes SMEs, of course, particularly vulnerable to any shocks to the banking sector and reduces their ability to switch among banks. And, of course, as smaller firms tend to be less transparent than larger firms, more difficult to give the required uh, level of information, it is more costly for investors to obtain this adequate information. This makes it harder for SMEs to substitute capital market finance for bank finance if the latter dries up. So, what is the solution here? There are many schemes underway in Europe to address the problem that I will not try to cover today. But one unifying theme that I see as critical is to better match the needs of SMEs with the funds of non-bank investors, thus providing more diversification for SMEs. This could be done, for example, when uh, we have private debt funds or peer-to-peer -peer lenders which could fill the gap of credit finance and thus help smooth the credit cycle. Another way is in terms of maturities, while regulatory changes have made commercial banks less willing to make long-term loans, some large institutional investors, for example pension funds and insurance companies, need assets with maturities and returns that match their liability profiles. As ME lending can provide this, especially while long-term safe assets exhibit low rates of return. We have seen that uh, to some extent this is happening in Europe, but let me quickly move to my last point, that is the second answer the second initiative is to increase the capacity for non-bank investors to lend indirectly to SMEs via securitizations. We have recently published at the ECB together with the Bank of England a paper on securitization and we will follow up shortly with a more extensive paper to show the different ways that we want uh, to see as promising to uh, and worse reflecting that the new normal should be once a credit cycle picks up. As a conclusion, my message today is quite simple. The euro area financial system has been hit by a major shock, which few of us had foreseen, but through good policy choices, it is possible to steer this development towards a positive outcome while still avoiding unintended consequences. And looking at the developments across the euro area today, in my view, the right choices have been made. Banks are already strengthening their capital as a result of the comprehensive assessment. 
The European supervisor will be fully operational in November this year. From next year on, we will start building up a single fund for European bank resolution. And the initiatives are underway to strengthen access to finance for SMEs, especially through securitization. For Asia, there is every reason to be confident that the euro area is addressing the structural problems in its financial system, which should in turn support more sustainable growth in Europe and, as a consequence also for the world economy. We still have a long way to go, to be sure, but I am confident that Europe has now moved from being a risk to the global economy to be a partner in global growth. Thank you for your attention. Uh,我今天这个报告的题目是呃一个长期问题，就亚洲经济增长为什么不可持续？呃，零八年危机到现在呢，我们大概看到两个现象啊。第一个现象呢，这个发达国家的正在从慢慢的复苏当中走向呃
啊，所以供给突破了约束，需求突破了约束，经济增长就开始啊，在欧洲首先出现了。呃，如果你把把按照这个标准来对照一下亚洲呢，我们就会亚洲发现，至今仍然很多的国家停留在农耕文明，啊，对内是不改革的，对外是不开放的。那只要你对内不改革，对外不开放，就没有增长的机会，于是就会贫困。贫困呢，导致了战争和革命，限制了正常的经济，正常的这个经济活动。所以这里面有个因果关系。在很多亚洲国家的教科书里边怎么讲呢？说我们为什么贫困？是因为欧洲人员殖民了，是因为我们有战争、有动乱，所以导致了亚洲经济不能增长。那么这是结果还是原因？啊，我想来想去，如如果你去实证一下，你就会发现这是结果。原因在，因为你停留在农耕文明，因为你贫困，所以才有战争，才有动乱。然后从对外这个角国际竞争当中角度来讲呢，因为你停留在农耕文明，没有经济增长，没有竞争力，就成为国际竞争当中的失败者。于是呢，在世界处在丛林时代的时候，殖民主义时代的时候，亚洲必然会成为欧洲的殖民地和本殖民地。啊，那这是关于呃一个历史的简单的一个讨论。呃，回到现在，我们就来看一下这个亚洲经济增长的一些特征啊。从一九四五年、五十年代开始，啊，首先是日本经济崛起，然后到了七零年的时候呢，东亚四小龙、四小虎崛起；到了一九七九年呢，中国改革开放；一九九二年的印度对外开放，啊，现在是整个东南亚地区啊，所有的这些国家经济都在增长啊，成亚洲成为新兴经济体啊，这个规模最大、数量最多的一个区域啊。但是亚洲经济增长，呃、啊，没有摆脱历史的这些啊痕迹。啊，所以呢，它仍然有自己一些独特的特点，制约着它的成长。那么，亚洲经济增长的机会呢，首先有必要回顾一下，就美国所起的作用啊。美国来到这个世界，从一九呃四一年太平洋战争走进世界舞台，它为世界带来了三大东西啊。第一，接受了殖民主义统治啊，生产了这个国际安全，建立了联合国啊，于是一个丛林时代就结束了，和平与发展的时代就到来了。啊，这给很多低收入国家、前殖民地、半殖民地国家有了经济增长的机会。第二呢，美国提供了一个顺差市场，通过建立关贸总协定到 WTO， 啊，几乎给所有啊新兴市场经济体创造了一个顺差市场。啊，如果今天我们全球经济学家都去关注美国和新兴资产经济国家、新兴市场经济国家之间的再平衡，那么这种机会就没有了。所以，这个对于世界经济失衡的问题究竟如何理解啊？是是贸易要保持平衡好，还是这个呃，在一个失衡的世界当中，给新兴市场经济国家更多的发展空间和机会好啊？这是一个需要讨论的问题。那么第三呢，美国提供了一个稳定的世界货币体系啊，特别是在金本位时代，美元与黄金挂钩的时间时代呢，维持了一个固定汇率啊，这个对全球贸易呢是起到了一个巨大的促进作用。啊，这是，呃，我想说，就是为什么这个亚洲国家会有机会啊？可能和英国时代结束、美国时代的到来啊，就创造的一个世界和平增长的这个环境是有关系。呃，第二，啊，亚洲经济开始发力增长，那么我们来看一下亚洲经济增长的力度、周期以及它的可持续性。啊，我们仍然用麦迪森的数据啊，来来看一下呢，你就会发现第一。就是实际上，我们亚洲国家普遍要比欧美晚了一百年到两百年实现经济增长，然后呢，在增长的力度上是不够。啊，你看欧美的斜率比较高，亚洲国家的斜率都不够。啊，去掉规模因素以后，你就会发现，啊，增长率亚洲国家明显不如欧美。这这就是我们需要的检讨的问题。问就为什么亚洲的经济增长达不到欧美的这种境界？啊，像他那样表表现的那样出色。啊，这是这是一个从统计数据里面我们可以看到的。另外呢，我们就发现持续时间很短，啊，日本基本上五十年经济就开始衰退了。我们中国三十五年，现在经济就出现拐点往下走了。就未来中国经济增长还有没有希望，我们不知道。啊，我们不知道现在危机啊，这个人民币贬值、房地产泡沫会不会破掉？会不会让中国重新啊掉到一个呃呃这个所谓的中等收入增长的这个陷阱里边？啊，就是统计数据告诉我们的，亚洲经济增长，啊，确实有机会，但是表现并不是最好的，啊，并不是最好。
呃，这是第二。那么第三呢？我们从亚洲经济表现不好，如如呃，除了这个呃增长表现之外，还有它这结构，这个增长的结构上呢，呃，亚洲国家有两个特点，就它属于赶超型的经济，政府扮演的重要的角色，这是第一个特点，政府主导啊。那么第二呢，亚洲经济具有呃非常严重的外生性。啊，那么这个外生性呢？如果呃，我们用一个图示来说明一下呢，大家看一下是这个、啊，这个销售是控制在市场渠道是控制在欧美发达工业化国家里边的，亚洲缺资源啊，除了印尼、菲律宾那个国那些国家还有点资源，大部分国家没有资源啊，特别是东东北亚啊，东亚缺乏资源，这个也是在外部的，然后在全球的产值。这个分工链里边呢，研发和设计在发达国家，啊，加工组装在亚洲，所以亚洲国家的经济增长具有典型的外生性，就它是呃以外包为主，纯以加工组装，呃，两头在外，研发设计在国外，然后呢，销售市场在国外，并且依赖于资源进口，这就给亚洲经济造成了一个很大的约束。对，亚洲必须是一个开放的经济体。亚洲不可能成为欧洲，亚洲不可能成为美国，依靠自己的啊所有的要素的组合来实现一个有效的经济增长啊，这是我们看到的第二个特点啊。那么第三个特点呢，就是走到今天呢，亚洲啊通亚洲国家通过经济增长呢，已经呃在在这个禀赋相似的这个一个区域经济里边呢，形成了产品可替代啊竞争性的一个相互竞争性的一个经济。所以很难形成经济联盟啊！如果是互补性的经济呢，可能会呃有助于促成一个经济联盟的形成。但是，一旦变成一个呃禀赋相似、产品可替代的一个呃经济区域的时候呢，合作就很难。所以，最近随着经济的增长，我们就会发现亚洲国家内生啊、呃、内生的这种冲突和矛盾不断是在在加剧啊。那么，特别是走向区域合作，困难重重。啊，那如果你来看这个区域合作，亚洲国家的最大的障碍在什么地方呢？第一，文化是多元的，啊，这有各种各样的宗教，很难形成共识。第二呢，地理是分割的，它和北美大陆和欧洲大陆是不一样的。我们经常讲一衣带水，啊，当中的呃岛屿，呃这个海洋把这个亚洲分割了，所以要素是很难流动的。啊，然后在这个后验证时代，产业替代率很高。那么这样就阻止了亚洲的区域性的经济合作，所以无法产生像美国、像欧洲这样通货区可以带来的这种竞争优势啊，竞争优势，呃，让亚洲的经济增长呢，呃，成为不可持续。啊，那么有了有有了这些基本的我们的这个数据和一些问题，接下来我们第三个问题就是亚洲进一步来讨论为什么啊，描述了它的特征以后，就它为什么不可持续增长？先看一下文献，啊，那么讨论亚洲的文献很多啊，我把这些呃最重要的呃几个观点呢，啊，呃给大家这个描述一下，呃，萨克斯讲群体资本主义，啊，家族资本主义限制了亚洲的经济增长，啊，修亨德里讲，亚洲在 GDP 增长的时候却没有创造人均财富，啊，这个财富主要集中在政府，主要集中在啊国家手里。这就好比没有鸡尾酒的，呃，这个鸡尾酒会啊、呃，完全没意义。然后呢，亚洲很多国家啊、呃，没有进行全面的土地改革，解决不了农民问题，啊、呃，整个国家在忙于寻租，啊、呃，这是乔斯塔威尔讲，啊、呃，保罗克鲁格曼呢，在很早的时候就讲讲亚洲忽略人力资本投资，啊、呃，然后呢，麦克佩蒂斯讲。亚洲是靠什么？靠贸易顺差，美国的贸易逆差和外国人的消费来维持了一个出口推动的经济增长。啊，那么这个联合国呃助理秘书长阿贾伊奇博呢，最近啊一一个表述很有意思啊啊，那么多文字我就不说了啊。他要说的意思是，这个社会没有解决啊一系列的这个呃、啊、基本的制度构建，所以亚洲崛起的是黑领。啊，具有就是具有黑社会性质的黑人啊，利用这个制度的啊这个缺陷，那、啊、在制度的缝隙里边游走的啊，获取这个财富的这么一个黑人阶层在崛起啊，呃、啊，既不白也不黑，呃、啊，也也也不是那个红啊，这那么文献的大概有那么多的表述啊，那我们的研究呢，呃。
呃，把刚才这些文件，我们如果我们再做一些数据补充啊，这这些我收集到的一个数据呢，就是呃一条很有意思的曲线，叫奈克曲线，就是亚洲没有走向现代国家啊，那那么它可能会无法出现可持续的增长。奈克曲线呢，把所有的国家分成四种经这个政治体制构架，一个是中央集权的，一个是混合政权的，一个是有缺陷的民族，还有完全民族啊。那么一般来讲，高收入国家完全民族。啊，在中央集权国家里边，也有少数几个高收入国家，那是靠资源；大部分贫困国家都是政治体制有缺陷的。啊，所以亚洲如果不同农耕文明，啊，传统的中央集权的政治体制下，现代啊民主社会转型呢，要实现这个人均收入水平的提高和走向富裕。啊，从这条奈克曲线来讲呢，可能不太可能啊，不太可能。啊，然后亚洲的这个确实像联合国这个副秘书长朱立秘书长所讲的，收入分配差距很大。呃，这两两条红色的线，一个是讲中国的城市的，啊，一个是讲中国的农村的经济系数的增长，啊，都是很高位。那么这个经济系数的增长原因何在呢？如果你从这个右边这个角度来讲呢，横轴是一个 GDP 的增长，纵轴是就业的增长。如果做一条对应曲线是这条线，就是如果经济增长百分之二，就业增长百分之二，就是增长是被公平分配的。那么你看亚洲大部分国家都落在这个三角区里边，这个三角区里边就告诉你，亚洲的经济增长啊是忽略忽略人，就是没有出现机会均等。所以这个经济系数就会扩大，收入分配啊，这个严重失衡啊。对，那么当然统计表现最不好的是中国，中国在这个位置，那么这个位置就告诉你 GDP 一直在增长，整个社会就业是不增长的。那也就是说，能够分享经济增长机会的人是少的，因此一定是收入分配两极分化，缺少一个庞大的中产阶级。那么，因为经济经济上缺少一个庞大的中产阶级，那整个社会民主体制体制改革就滞后了，你就很难走向了民主社会。就中产阶级是是是，这个对民主是有诉求的，然后是对政治这个经济是要采取这个喜喜欢稳定啊，这、就是关于金融系数啊。那么还有就是这个克鲁格曼讲的人力资本，啊，你从人力资本的角度来讲呢，呃，尽管我们很多亚洲国家最近很重视教育的发展，但是中亚洲国家的教育是有缺陷的，啊，特别是中国，呃、啊，我们如果按照世界论坛二零一二年的一个统计数据，每一百个工科院校的毕业生，啊，这个毕业以后马上可以上岗成为工程师的，美国是八十一个，印度是二十五个，在中国只有十个。那么中国不是因为教学教育的投入不够，是你的体制，农耕教育，啊，中国的教育可以用六个字来概括：书写、背诵、考试，最后是为了升官发财，基本不增加人力资本，完全属于一种规范教育，而不是能力教育，啊，那么原因何在呢？如果看一下联合国呃这个做的一个研究，你就会发现，中国的教育是属于这种类型的，纯粹是课堂里边。啊，书写、背诵、考试的，但是最成功的教育，应该是把课堂里边的教育和工作实践的教育整合在一起。啊，亚洲很多的国家缺乏这种做法。那么我举这些统计数据呢，无非就是呼应呼应一下前面文献里边所讲的这些经济学家的研究，在亚洲是可以找到证据的。啊，就是亚洲确实存在这些问题，但是这些问题的背后是什么？啊，还有就政府，啊，政府拿钱太多。呃，政府主导经济增长，那么呃，中国的最近两年的统计数据就呃很清晰。从一九七九年改革开放到二零零四年这段时间，中国的税收增长的斜率基本上在十五度。但是二零零四年以后，搞和谐社会、搞收入再分配，政府主导经济增长以后，你突然发现税收迅速增长，斜率几乎达到七十五度到八十度，这是一个非常不可思议的问题。啊，那么这这这个统计数据背后是什么？那就企业的利润率在下降，税后利润率在下降。一旦企业税后利润率下降了，资本就会被消灭，实体经济就会被消灭。实体经济消灭了，泡沫一定会发生，然后泡沫是不可持续的，啊，迟早这个泡沫会破掉。所以我们今天中国面临的最严重的问题就是实体经济不断的在被消灭，税收不断的在增长，资产价格不断的在上涨。呃，这是关于政府这个税收，啊，还有指数啊，从税收指数来讲，这是政府税收增长的指数 ，GDP 增长的指数，城市居民收入增长的指数，农村居民增长收入的指数，啊，所以从这几个指数来讲呢，呃，就很容易判断中国属于一个政府主导的经济，就政府、国富、民穷。
啊，国强内衰，就这样的增长一定是不可持续的。所以，我想用这些统计数据呢，来回应一下。啊，上面所讲的这些经济学家做的这些研究，啊，那么接下来呢，呃，我我我的呃看法是什么？就亚洲、呃、前面的这些文献，它只是回答了是什么的问题，就 What is this？ 没有没有解决这个问题 ，Why？ 就为什么亚洲经济会走上是走上这样一条增长的道路？啊，那在我在我看来呢，就是亚洲经济的这个呃。为什么会不可持续增长？关键的问题是我们选择了一个赶超，啊，赶超，而赶超呢，基于发展就会忽略社会转型，啊，从而走上了以欧洲、呃，包括以美国在内的这些国家经济增长的不同的道路，啊，如果我们来看一下一个图描述，应该是这个描述：纵轴是经济增长，横轴是时间周期。欧洲人花了两百到三百年，通过文艺复兴、宗教改革、社会变革。奠定了经济增长的可持续增长的社会环境，经济起飞，进入稳态。亚洲国家呢追赶，啊，忽略了社会的变革，啊 ，GDP 短期拉起来了，但是由于社会问题啊，限制了经济增长的最后，很多国家又会重新回归贫困，啊，掉入所谓的中等收入陷阱。啊，什么是中等收入陷阱呢？呃、啊，有各种定义。啊，但是我我的定义是什么呢？一个没有中产阶级的国家的经济增长一定会掉入中等。受到限制，所以关键的问题在在于能不能经济增长形成一个强大的中产阶级，啊，啊那么回回到前头这一呢，我们来看，呃、啊，社会转型，呃、啊，软转型不够啊，急于发展。那么转型之后的亚洲呢，就具有这样几个特点：第一，文化是传统的；第二，政治是近代的，但是呢，在谋求使用现代技术。啊，那传统文化呢压制了创新，所以亚洲国家基本上靠成本竞争。一旦成本提高了，它就会出局。近代政府促成了政府主导的经济增长，使得国家和市场之间的关系处在内生的紧张当中，人民的创造性，啊，包括市场的力量都受到了压制。啊，然后依靠现代技术，啊，现代技术大部分是引进的是 “learning by doing”， 啊，具有外生性。一旦亚洲国家进入前技术前沿的时候，并停止停止了前进。呃，这里边最典型的案例就是日本，啊、呃，一个没有创新的日本，最后就停止了前进。啊、呃，那么这样一个呃转型之后的具有这这些特征的亚洲，啊、呃，就属于一个非现代性增长。啊、呃，没有基本人权和产权，没有人民群众的创造性，所以它是非现代性的增长。那非现代性的增长呢，突出表现在这么几点上，在我看来，第一是一个非制度化的市场经济。啊，如果从内部角度来讲，把市场仅仅作为一个交易技术，不是作为一个创造财富的制度安排，然后是不合规的对外开放，啊，到处是贸易保护，那、啊、最后呢，这个增长的目标不是为了让人人走向啊这个富有，而是强国啊，很多国家还在做帝国复兴的梦，啊，那么这这这就是我们讲的亚洲国家经济增长的一些啊，在非现代性的这个。几个表现，那么我把这个分现代性呢，如果呃有有两点在做个补充，啊，首先表现为这个非制度化的市场，制度化的市场呢，根据经济学家的描述，大概需要三个条件，一个是明确的产权系统，保护人们的财产权，形成强大的产权激励，一个呢是一套可执行的规则和法规，来约束个人之间的契约。然后呢，一个透明化的信息形成一套稳定的价格系统，但是在亚洲很多国家缺少这些东西，啊，所以制度是缺损的。制度一旦缺损了，市场就成为成一种仅仅成为一种交易的技术，于是形成了今天我们所看到的亚洲国家里面很多非制度化的市场。非制度化的市场造成的后果是掠夺性的胜负和掠夺性的交易。掠夺性的政府表现在什么地方呢？就是政府越过其知名边界，进入市场与民争利。啊，这个在中国大家可以看到非常清楚，中央政府在经营国有资产，中央政府在经营公共品，高速公路都还要卖钱，所以你说这个物流成本怎么下得来呢？竞争力怎么怎么怎么能够提高呢？啊，我们纳税人都都上过税了，但是呢，上高速公路你还得付费，啊，所以这这是中央政府，而地方政府在经营什么呢？经营城市，经营土地。这个农民的问题就别想解决了，农民的问题解决不了，农民占总人口的比重下不来，消费占 GDP 的比重是上不去的
我们天天在讲，美国的消费占 GDP 的比重有多高？我们的比重为什么这么低？然后我们用政策去刺激，能解决这个问题吗？不是的，就消费占 GDP 的比重一定是农民占总人口的比重决定的。农民占总人口的比重越低，消费占 GDP 的比重才能上去。啊，这不是简单的一个去模仿，我们老是在模仿啊，不去不去找到这个问题是内在的根本原因，啊，所以很可能就解决不了这个问题。啊，那么中国有一句俗话啊，叫“上梁不正下梁歪”。政府是掠夺性的政府，那么市场里边所有行为人越过道德底线，从事掠夺性的交易。如果你就在中国市场里边就会看到，找不到合格的商品。啊，最近我觉得全世界是误读了中国人，因为中国人疯狂的到海外逢年逢年过节出去消这个消品去去购物，是中国人有钱了，其实不对。很多中国人出去购物是因为在国内市场买不到合格的商品，千万别把中国居民的海外消费行为给解读错。那我们这个大量的中国人到海外购物，一个很重要的原因是国内缺乏合格的商品，因为这是一个掠夺性的市场，所有人只是想通过交易牟利，而不是为这个市场、为为为他的这个消消费者提供合格的商品。啊，关于这个，呃，我就说到这，啊。那么对外开放，就像大部分亚洲国家仍然保留着，呃，这个二元经济结构一样，几乎所有亚洲国家都具有开放经济下的二元结构，即一个具有竞争力的出口部门和一个受到政府保护的封闭的落后的部门，比如农业，比如服务业，比如金融，比如公有企业垄断的部门都没有对外开放，完全缺乏竞争力，缺乏效率。啊，那么造成这个原因何在？因为我们。是一个不合规的对外开发，政府主导，保护弱者，产业政策，啊。那么说呃说完这些以后呢，呃，我想做一个结论，就是亚洲如何才能实现可持续的增长？啊，亚洲的问题是在于 catch up， 在 catch up 的过程当中忽略了太多应该改革和调整的东西，所以现在到了我们应该重新来认识这些问题，重新采取行动的时候。亚洲国家要实现经济可持续增长的，我觉得大概三个行动：第一，政策行动，控制成本，提高生产率，不是结构调整。今天所有经济学家到中国来，所有论坛上都会讲，我们要调结构，调结构是对的吗？完全是错的。第一，结构是刚性的，结构是代际才能调整，一代人、两代人才能调整结构。五年的经济规划产调整不了产业结构，结构是刚性的，啊，然后还要受到禀赋的约束。第二。调结构就是把资源的配置权利集中到政府，不调结构就是把资源的配置权利交给市场和企业，所以调结构肯定是不对的。那么，如果你再从经济学最基本的供求均衡的角度来讲，我们怎么可以调结构呢？你看一下，全世界高收入市场人均收入超过两万美元以上的只有一点七五亿人，全世界人均收入超过三千美金以上的中产阶级的市场十四亿人，对不对？全收入。呃，全世界这个人均收入低于三千美金的，将近五十亿人。我们现在中国要调结构，放弃五十亿人的大市场，去做一点七五亿人的高端产品，你卖给谁呀？你供求能均衡吗？首先，你从供求角度来讲，你是美国的竞争对手吗？是欧洲的竞争对手吗？是日本的竞争对手吗？你不是。第二，如果你去做了这些产品，你会有需求吗？这个市场怎么 cleaning 啊？出清怎么出清啊？你中国怎么可以放弃五十亿人的这个大的市场去做一点七五亿人才需要的产品呢？如果真的调了这个结构，中国满街都是失业，中国的农民从此以后永远别想进城。二元结构的社会问题根本解决不了，所以结构调不调，这不是政府说了算的事情，一定是市场，一定是企业。企业家的决策、市场的决策才能解决这个问题。所以，我觉得政府要做的是控制成本，别把地价搞高了。别把工资搞高了，生产率没有提高，你加工资那就是增加成本；生产率提高了，增加工资，这才叫增加收入。政府需要的是进行什么？职业培训、人力资本投资，不是调工资。第二，社会行动，社会行动，亚洲需要完成什么？人民转型，啊，欧洲人走过的那个那那段路程，亚洲人必须要走的，那就是完成农耕文明到现代工业文明的转型。文化上，啊，要要要要有变革，那么民众才有自主创新的能力，才有创新精神。第二呢，要限制政府，人权在上，主权在下
。所有亚洲国家搞民主，大部分都失败了。为什么？主权在上、人权在下的国家搞民主一定失败。主权在上。竞选成功拿了主权去压迫他人的人权，一定会有二次革命、三次革命。所以不是人权在上，没有宪政，是主权在上的国家搞民主一定是失败的。所以不是民主不好，是亚洲国家缺乏推广民主制度必须的改革。啊，这是限制政府。然后第三呢，我们要市场主导，取消产业政策，让市场呢在全全社会的资源配置当中起决定性的作用。啊，那么这些改革是必须做的。那最后区域行动，啊，区域行动，亚洲的区域共同体是不可能建立的。我前面讲了有很多的啊，这个天然的屏障、地理位置、文化、宗教多元，没有共识。但是亚洲可以采取些什么行动呢？第一，贸易自由化，通过自贸区啊来突破。第二呢，投资自由化，可以建立准入门槛。第三呢，区域经呃货币合作，我们没办法建成货币联盟，没建没办法建成通货区，但是可以通过区域货币合作来防止亚洲国家不同货币之间的并竞争性贬值，啊，然后来维护亚洲的稳定，啊，那么以上就是我想呃呃说的一些东西，谢谢大家。Well, um. Um, this year, we expect that Korean economy will grow at the rate of 4%, um, recovering from 3% of the last year. And uh, this uh, performance might be remarkable for many uh, um, Western observers, especially given that world economy is now uh, uh, no, no, is not rapidly recovering, but uh, well, it's not really a proud of uh, for many Koreans. Maybe it's uh, disappointing for many Chinese. Personally, I think that this uh, growth of four percent is quite uh, good if it could sustained and. So uh, it's real uh, high time to think about uh, whether we could grow at this rate, maybe 8% or maybe above. And basically, I think that uh, what we have done so far uh, is not that bad, which means uh, although uh, some of Asian economic growth model had its uh, uh, maybe um, weak points. Uh, we could, at least for Korea, we could continue, uh, we could uh, keep on going uh, on the basis of this model. So that's basically a, my uh, main message I'd like to convey uh, today. My presentation will be uh, composed of three parts. Uh, the first part, uh, in the first part, I'll try to assess uh, the what is called uh, East Asia model, because uh, Korean economic growth was based on this model. And second, I'll focus more on the Korean experience, uh, especially uh, regarding uh, the economic performance we uh, had uh, after 2008 global financial crisis. And thirdly, I'll just uh, briefly speak about what we have to do. Of course, uh, as you know, central bankers are concerned more with uh, those issues related to short-term macroeconomic stabilization, but uh, well, uh, this time I'll take a different approach so that I will, uh, uh, well, uh, take a more long-term, maybe a very, very long-term uh, approach. So uh, let me begin with this uh, uh, East Asian uh, model. What are the features, what are the main features of East Asian models? Basically, I think it has two important pillars. 
the first uh, most important pillar is that it was uh, investment driven. So uh, this uh, weakness was uh, uh, pointed out already by many uh, famous uh, economists, including uh, uh, Arun Young and Paul Krugman. So I don't need to uh, spend time on this point. And secondly, uh, this, the East Asian model is export-led uh, model. Again, so again, uh, this model was dissuaded. Uh, for instance, very recently, Wall Street uh, uh, had an article on, on uh, this exported, uh, export-oriented model, saying that uh, this model is no longer working, especially given that uh, advanced economies is not recovering, for instance. And uh, China is, uh, is under the pressure to reduce uh, its uh, current account surplus, for, ins for instance. So uh, both of these pillars are, are questioned. And uh, focusing on uh, three uh, East Asian economies, Korea, Japan, and China, we could uh, have three different, I feel like, um, uh, types or patterns. First, um, as I'll show you, you have uh, such country like Japan, where uh, investment share is uh, falling rapidly, and export uh, sector is also uh, not well uh, performing at least. So very disappointing. Uh, and uh, you have uh, a country like Korea where uh, investment share is uh, dropping substantially while uh, it's maintaining export share. And you have uh, a country like China where uh, well, investment share is uh, increasing quite uh, substantially, especially after 2008 uh, global financial crisis, while export sector is, uh, is, uh, is a little bit uh, falling. So uh, you could see the figure one, for instance. So this is the investment share, as you see. Here, the red line is uh, for China. And uh, the purple line is uh, for Korea, and the uh, yellow one is for Japan. So after uh, the burst of bubble in 1990s, the share of investment relative to GDP in Japan is falling rapidly. In the case of Korea, well, this uh, increase in uh, investment share continued maybe until the outbreak of uh, 1997 currency crisis, then you see this uh, investment share is dropping quite substantially. And uh, China, in the case of China, it's still going up, but now uh, the question is whether th this could be maintained or sustained. So uh, for that matter, well, uh, well, I don't think that uh, it could be maintained. And then, um, what about consumption? Uh, you see that uh, maybe except for China, Japan and Korea are seeing uh, their share of consumption uh, increasing, although at a very slow rate. In the case of China, it's still uh, falling. Uh, so uh, this means that uh, there is more, uh, if you like, room for China to pick up this consumption share, while there is a smaller room for Korea and Japan. And in fact, what I think is important in this uh, uh, figure is that, uh, well, uh, many uh, people are suggesting, for instance, consumption-led growth as a 
an alternative to uh, investment-driven or expert-driven uh, growth. But the important question is whether uh, this drop in investment rate could uh, sufficiently strong to compensate uh, for the drop in uh, for, for, the, uh, for the rise in in consumption. Basically, at least as far as I understand, for China, this is not the case. Until very recently, this is not the case uh, either for Korea and uh, maybe, well, until the outburst of the bubble, this is not the case uh, for Japan. And now, let's go to this uh, table, uh, figure three, export share. Well, um, you see that Korean cases uh, are really uh, extraordinary in the sense that uh, the export share continue to uh, grow quite uh, rapidly. So uh, you could see here, uh, maybe you could compare the case of Korea with the case of Germany. So these two countries are quite uh, performing well in this export uh, sector. In the case of Japan, well, although uh, export share slightly increased, maybe uh, until the 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 outburst of 2008 global financial crisis, its share remained really uh, weak for quite a very long time. I think this is one reason why Japan had to suffer 20-year long recession. While uh, you see in the case of China, this export share uh, went up quite substantially until maybe 2008, then uh, it shows some uh, uh, drop. So this summarizes maybe a, the different uh, maybe a, a patterns of growth, at least for three countries. On the one side, on one extreme, you have China. On the other hand, you have Japan. And Korea is in between, in the sense that uh, Korea uh, could continue to maintain uh, its export uh, competitiveness and export market share while uh, its, import, its investment uh, rate is, uh, is, is continuously falling. So, uh, I think that uh, for a country like Korea, we could not, uh, well, this export uh, sector competitiveness is so important. So we could not, uh, well, uh, do without, without this. this uh, maybe, well, uh, for a country like China, because it's too big, uh, Consumption-led growth uh, could be possible, but I don't think that this does apply, at least for the, uh, to the case of Korea. I think that Japan shows good uh, counterexample anyway in this sense. So this is more or less uh, my observation uh, based on this uh, uh, comparison of three East Asian countries. So now let me move to the, the, the Korean case, how uh, we could maintain maybe uh, the export sector competitiveness and, and what uh, is the problem for Korea, uh, especially in uh, um, relate to the, the our investment performance. So um, uh, since Korea uh, had a uh, currency crisis uh, in 1997, we had uh, two big, uh, if you like, uh, reforms. The first uh, big reform was uh, maybe a forced uh, by uh, the international organization at the time, uh, IMF. And uh, it was good, in fact, in the sense that it was really the chance for Korea to accelerate diverse liberalization and market opening programs. So uh, it helped Korean firms to restore its competitiveness. Although, as I, well, I, not, I do not have the mind to explain in detail, but uh, exchange rate depreciation helped more, maybe in the short term perspective for uh, 
But I have still the impression that this uh, reform was too excessive in the sense that whenever you have an illness, maybe you, you need uh, a drug. But sometimes the, the drug is too strong. So that both uh, good germs and bad germs are, 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 are killed. But anyway, uh, this is a, a very important reform uh, that helped Korean firms to find the necessary competitiveness. And the second important re reform was, uh, was all those uh, regional trade arrangements through which Korea could uh, be more, if you like, uh, open. So basically, we, 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 we uh, uh, um, try to have as many uh, FTAs with as many uh, partner countries. So for instance, uh, before 2003, we had no single FTA, whatever, uh, with foreign country. But after that, uh, we have, as you know, we had FTA with the US. We had FTA with U uh, European Union. So uh, it was real uh, opportunity for Korea to be global. Uh, furthermore, our FTA with these two countries, uh, two big countries like US and European Union were very high level, if you like, and comprehensive FTA, including the service uh, liberalization and so on. I think all this helped anyway, uh, Korea. So as you see, uh, even uh, after 2008 global financial crisis, you see the our export to share increased that much. And in fact, you could just calculate the contribution of net export to our growth. Normally, well, uh, uh, well this uh, contribution of export sector to the growth is calculated just on the basis of net export. But uh, if you have more precise uh, calculation, if you take more precise calculation method, uh, the contribution of net export sector is much higher so that more than 50% of Korean export is explained by this export sector. Well, this uh, slide uh, shows uh, again that uh, Korean export sector became very competitive. For instance, uh, you know, uh, on the left-hand side, uh, you could s uh, see the share of uh, manufacturing sector in, 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 in our uh, GDP. Uh, so that Korea, you see, uh, well, only in Korea, you see this manufacturing, the share of manufacturing sector is increasing. While uh, what is remarkable is that uh, you see that the, the number of total employees is decreasing. That's why I said this uh, 1997 IMF prescription for the structural reform in Korea was too excessive. Because anyway, although Korea could grow uh, at a quite uh, substantial rate, uh, it does not create employment uh, these days. So this is, uh, if you like, maybe side effect, but uh, it's true that it helps Korean firms to recover the necessary uh, competitiveness uh, substantially. And uh, this is not all the story, of course. Korean firms and Korean uh, um, Korean firms uh, increased uh, uh, their R&D uh, investment uh, substantially. So as you see, uh, Korea is one of the countries where this R&D expenditure relative GDP was now one of the highest in the world. And furthermore, it uh, increased at a very rapid rate. So it helped anyway a, a Korean uh, economy to uh, maintain its export sector competitiveness and thereby uh, maintaining uh, its export market. And, uh, but the problem is, uh, so, so the important question is whether this export, uh, if you like, lead growth could be maintained further in the future. And I, I, I think that, yes, we could, we could maintain it uh, further in the future if we Im take some further uh, measures or if we strengthen some efforts to do it. Now let's uh, briefly uh, examine uh, the investment uh, 
of Korea. Well, uh, as you see here, uh, you could uh, probably have three uh, observations. Uh, the first important observation is that uh, as uh, gross fixed investment rate is falling, GDP growth is falling. And uh, second observation uh, is that maybe until the until the 2000, uh, well, uh, investment uh, the investment rate was uh, much larger uh, than GDP growth rate, which means that investment led uh, economic growth in Korea. And since 2000, of course. Uh, investment rate is much lower than the GDP, which means that uh, investment sector is no longer the engine of growth. And again, um, uh, the third important point is that uh, the profit rate continued to decline together with this uh, investment rate. So until 2000, you see that uh, current profit rate is declining, but since uh, 2000, uh, it's going up. So it shows that, well, maybe a, until 2000, the drop in investment is inevitable because uh, a more investment could, meet, could lead to more uh, excess capacity, more, uh, if you like, inefficiencies. Uh, but uh, since, to, since 2000, uh, well, it's no longer the case. But despite the fact that uh, Korean companies could recover those profit rate, they did not invest. They make money, but they just hold it. So, um, so uh, this figure nine and figure ten shows, uh, you know, Korean shows that Korean companies have. Uh, enough capacity to increase the investment. That's a very important point, but they do not invest. So uh, as a result, you see there uh, now Korean debt ratio is the lowest in the world. Of course, that's a very a fragmentary uh, figure, but at least it shows that, uh, well, um, Korean companies have, have all this capacity to increase inv its investment. So my impression uh, is that, well, uh, some drop in investment is in inevitable. But uh, in the case of Korea, this drop in investment is too much. And this does not help uh, not only Korean economy, but also uh, global economies to recover. Because anyway, it's better for the global economy, for the advanced economy, if Korea increases its investment. But this increase in fixed investment was, uh, was uh, blamed that much when, when we had currency crisis 997. So maybe we have to take some balanced uh, stance here, but at least as you see here, as a result of this drop in investment, it's not just uh, because of drop in saving, it's not just because of uh, investment, uh, Korea could uh, record, if you like, structural uh, surplus since 2000. So uh, you see, so this is the the current account of Korea, and and um, that does not help for Korean uh, economy and for global economy. Uh, so um, again, uh, well, um, I don't think that. Uh, uh, our strategy so far was was not that much wrong. Probably, if you like, uh, old wine is always better than new wine, unless unless it turns out 
sour. So I think that we have we have to improve our model, but uh, basically uh, what what you have done is not that much bad in this respect. So let's um, uh, now move on. What we have to do then? I think that Korea could further increase its export uh, share, if you like, once we uh, strengthen our globalization uh, effort, in particular regional uh, integration effort. Well, I think that regionalization is in, some, in, in, is in some sense a process of internalizing external markets. So once you have a uh, free movement of uh, goods, services, maybe capital and people, then the market is more like an uh, internal market. So one reason why it's so difficult for Korea to rely on consumption-led growth is just because Korean market is too small. We have a company like Samsung so big that could compete on a global scale. But if you just focus on domestic market, that's no longer possible. So at least we need big markets. And uh, the consumption-led well, growth uh, is possible when you have big markets. But otherwise, it will be uh, difficult. But, any, uh, but uh, once you, you, you have uh, some uh, enough degree of regionalization, uh, increasing, well, this uh, export sector, export share is also possible. Uh, just because uh, the case of Germany and Netherlands shows that once, uh, for instance, uh, regional integration between uh, these North East Asian countries could be uh, made, uh, as you see still, uh, as of 2012, uh, intra-regional trade shares for these uh, three countries very low, while already in 1990, uh, well, uh, the uh, intra-regional trade share for Germany and Netherlands is so big. So, Korea could emulate these countries, uh, then uh, uh, increasing further the export share is possible. So uh, in that respect, of course, uh, we should uh, strengthen this uh, internal, it strengthen the regionalization, especially among uh, uh, Korea, Japan, China. But uh, of course, this is uh, this is, this might be a very long-term project. And another very important, uh, well, um, uh, challenge or task uh, is also uh, uh, to prepare for the integration of two Korean economies. Obviously, uh, because uh, this will uh, also contribute to furthering regionalization in Asia. This will create a huge new demand, huge new demand. So always, uh, you know, uh, in advanced countries, uh, they have all this excess capacity. In Asia, just because Korea and Japan uh, do not invest uh, enough, well, here we have this uh, excess surplus. But once North Korea is uh, is opened, for instance, it could create huge new aggregate demand, absorbing all these excess supplies. So, uh, I, well, uh, I could just uh, finish by showing up the case of uh, Germany. When, when, when uh, West Germany was uh, united with uh, East Germany, uh, they had Maybe uh, this uh, trade uh, current account surplus, uh, they, 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 they had this uh, current account deficit uh, for uh, more than uh, 10 years. Before this unification, uh, the current account uh, of the West of Germany was in uh, surplus, amounting to uh, more or less 2% of GDP. But since the unification, it uh, was uh, transformed into 4% of uh, trade uh, deficit. So if you, if you apply uh, the same, yes, I could finish just by one. 
Uh, if you apply the same story to the case of Korea, then it means uh, we have will uh, have a current account uh, deficit of six percent of GDP, which means uh, eight, uh, eighty billion dollars per year. If this go goes uh, on uh, for the next ten years, it means that uh, eight uh, hundred uh, billion dollars uh, uh, worth. Uh, uh, of new aggregate demand will be created. This is uh, not for Korean. Uh, this is not, this is not the demand for Korean goods. This is demand for uh, foreign countries' product. So I think it could create huge, you know, demand uh, e explosion for all the countries related. So uh, this could be a. A one possible way uh, in the future uh, for maybe Korea to uh, maintain its, uh, its uh, uh, potential growth rate. Thank you. Okay, I, 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 these are rather impressionistic comments because I, I haven't had a chance to read the papers before. Uh, we are, all three of the papers are about concerns about safety and soundness of our growth. Uh, uh, we saw a European perspective, uh, a Chinese perspective, and a Korean perspective. Uh, so I, let me, uh, uh, Mr. Moon said he considered it very important to take a long-term perspective. And I think that that's right, because I think that the problems that we're really worried about are long-term ones. Uh, uh, so the uh, one thing that struck me about all three papers, uh, now maybe you don't all have this long-term perspective firmly in mind, but it seems to me that if we're talking about economic growth over decades into the future, uh, we have to really think about how the world is changing. <laughs> uh, and decades into the future, uh, it's going to look a lot different in terms of our technology. So I would have thought that maybe information technology and the transformations that it's creating are, are really important. Uh, notably, the, the, the three papers uh, I don't mean to be critical here. I'm just thinking out loud about what comes to my mind in listening to them. Uh, the three papers all took a national perspective, yeah, well, considering Europe a nation, <laughs> uh, Europe, China, or Korea. But I think that one of the processes that's happening now is that globalization is accelerating, and people are becoming more and more international. Uh, so I don't even know what the business situation will look like. I'm remembered, reminded of a story when I wrote one of my recent books through Princeton University Press. Uh, my publisher uh, assigned to me for my London book tour a, a British woman because my publisher thought, well, an American needs help from a local to uh, be led around the city of London. I, I thought I could have done all right by myself, but she was there with me. So she takes me, one of my stops to talk about my book was a, a British bank. So we had a relatively small audience, but I gave a book talk there. And afterwards, my British guide afterwards said to me, you know what? Here I am trying to show you around Britain, but there was not a single Brit there in the audience. <laughs> There was every country of the world except Britain. So if you look at a modern British bank or a bank from many countries, they seem to be drawing talent from all over the place. And uh, generally, smart people end up anywhere now. Uh, and maybe that's especially true in a city like London, which is so international. Uh, but. I'm thinking about what will it be like in 20 or 30 years. Uh, 
we already see with the Shanghai Forum, for example, I see people from many countries of the world here today. How much more is that going to develop in, in 30 years? Uh, so, uh, some of the ratios that people, I saw a lot of ratios in these papers of one sort or another, but they tended to be defined in national terms. I'm sorry if these are kind of impressionistic comments, but I, I, I didn't have the opportunity to read the papers, and I may be ignoring some of your Im important uh, subtle subtleties. Uh, but in terms of economic growth, uh, I said this earlier today, but and it was also came up in paper in talks this morning that development theory suggests that economic growth is really enhanced by inclusiveness, bringing everyone in, and that means learning from your women as well as your men, and learning from whoever in the world knows. It, it's it, it's uh, and and also, I was thinking about China. The uh, you have a, a, a rural and an urban area, which are often contrasted. But the talents that are in the rural area must be formidable. And so it would seem that a national policy should try to identify talent. I, I don't know how much this is true. I, you know, here I am as an outsider. But I'm just thinking, from my perspective, you would want not to miss talented people wherever they are, and there should be a program that tries to identify them and bring them, bring them in. But this then brings up another point that I keep coming back to, and it's about the division of people between cosmopolitans and locals. Uh, this is a term that was devised by the sociologist Robert K. Merton about a half century ago. And he said that when you look at a population, he was looking at populations of people and trying to say, how can I classify people? And he reached the conclusion that some people, people reach a decision early in life, whether I'm a local or I'm a cosmopolitan. And most of you here are cosmopolitans, I think, but a cosmopolitan is someone who orients to the whole world. Uh, and the locals are someone who locates, the, uh, really focuses on the local community. And he said you can easily tell them apart with one question. This is, I'm quoting Merton. Uh, just ask, uh, is this a, a good town? Are, are people here nice and good? And if you meet a local, they will be effusive in praising their town. If you meet a cosmopolitan, they won't have any answer. <laughs> they can't think of anything. So, um, so in terms of the specific papers now, I'm um, just trying to think about uh, uh, yeah, Eve's um, Marsh paper, uh, Marsh, I'm pronouncing that right, uh, reflects a lot of knowledge about European Union regulation and policy. And uh, I'm afraid to get into that because it seems like uh, there's been a lot of thinking about the issues in the European context. I, I'm ready to believe uh, the, uh, uh, the issues that were talked about. Uh, but one thing that comes to my mind, in just in general thinking, is that there's an issue in Europe, but everywhere of course, but, it, but we hear about it a lot in Europe, uh, about corporatism, which I think is a word you mentioned. Uh, and in fact, when I was invited to conferences in Europe, I, I've been to one or two about corporatism. Uh, corporatism is a philosophy that the corporations or other organizations, the big companies, have incredibly, uh, or have great importance as they are, and that the general stance of the government should be to save them and keep them alive as opposed to, there's the um, Schumpeterian theory of creative destruction, that you say, just let them fail, just let them go under. And in, in the destruction, it will shake everything up. And the talented people in the failing organizations will regroup themselves and create something even better. Uh, 
So the, the person who's been arguing most about this is Professor Edmund Phelps at Columbia, who thinks that corporatist tendencies are a big hin hindrance to growth. So I'm thinking, of, for example, about shadow banks, which are talked about a lot in China and in the United States and in Europe. Uh, and the shadow banks are not like the traditional commercial banks uh, that have established regulatory bodies. They're creative and new and different, and a lot of them are more internet or electronically oriented. Uh, the term shadow bank was coined by Paul McCulley at PIMCO at some years ago. Uh, it, it makes it sound a little bit evil, shadow banks, <laughs> but uh, they're really, maybe some of them were, but generally they're not. I think they represent, uh, they represent uh, real uh, innovation. And uh, you don't always do things in a centuries old way. Uh, so, uh, so um, Mr. Mersch was talking about reform, uh, and uh, uh, I, I, I tend to think about reform in a more radical way. Maybe that's because I'm not uh, sitting on the board of a central <laughs> bank, and so I tend to think of far out reforms. But I did write a, a, a paper for the American Economic Review, which just came out, uh, about uh, with the title uh, something like uh, "Why Are Our <coughs> Mortgage Institutions So Still So Primitive?" The mortgage institutions that are used in the United States and Europe and other places were set in stone more or less uh, a half century ago or more. And, and there's a standard 30-year fixed rate mortgage. We discovered a problem with that during the financial crisis. And the problem was that there was no flexibility. And when home prices fell, the, especially since they'd been securitized and divided up into tranches, no one had the authority to reduce the balance on the mortgage for the homeowner, which would have been sensible for both sides. So uh, I was wondering why we haven't changed the nature of, of, of mortgage. There's a number of proposals that have been out there. One of them is a price level adjusted mortgage. Uh, but more dramatically, there's the partnership uh, uh, mortgage, or my own proposal, an, what I call an automated, automatic workout mortgage. Just the idea that you would plan ahead for uh, mortgages to be worked out in the case of a home price decline. Uh, so I guess uh, if we're thinking about the longer term, we ought to think about these more, fun more fundamental changes that might occur in the future. Um, so, uh, okay. So uh, Hua Min's paper, I found that um, most challenging because of the slides, which I had trouble <laughs> reading. <laughs> Uh, it was a good translation. So uh, uh, you said that uh, takeoffs in Asia do not last long. Uh, maybe I misheard that, but I, uh, I had uh, trouble. But I was wondering whether uh, that's a good generalization to make. Um, it looked that way in your plots, but I don't think that we have a statistically significant conclusion um, uh, that Asian. Uh, expansions don't last long. I, I personally feel optimistic about the Chinese growth uh, experience. Uh, and um, although there are things that are obviously limiting it, like uh, the change in demographics that's coming as the one child policy is now, we, China had a very large population of working age or people in their prime working age and that's going to change. Uh, and as that population diminishes, that's going to diminish economic growth. But, um, but there are other, uh, other factors. I'm, I'm just, um, uh, you talked about education. One thing that is really important, I think, I mentioned new technology, is the development of online education. Uh, and uh, I've been personally involved in this. Uh, I just completed my uh, online course in financial markets, which you all could have taken. <laughs> it was 
Uh, it's still up there, but you can't. Uh, well, we had a whole system. I, initially, I had, uh, I think it was 144,000 students signed up for my course. It's free. Anyone in the world can take it. Unfortunately, I had a high attrition rate, uh, although that's not just me. When you don't pay for anything, right, uh, why, it, you don't have the same motivation. So we did have a final exam. You had to get a 70% to pass the course. And we only had 8,000 pass the course. Uh, but still, I think, you know, this is something. I, I had 8,000 students who went through all of my lectures, did my problem sets, took my exam, and passed. I thought, you know, that, that's probably doubles, like compared to all the students I've ever taught at Yale. Uh, so this is the kind of thing that uh, helps deal with uh, issues of maybe in the next 30 years of inequality. I think we're learning and experimenting with online education. I worry though what it means for conventional education. I, I don't know the answer to all that. Uh, so uh, uh, finally the last paper by Mr. Moon. Uh, so I haven't studied Korea, but I, I was uh, looking at your numbers. You s seem particularly concerned about um, about the slower rate of growth in Korea. Um, yeah, okay. I'm actually running out of time. That's good. I, I was afraid I didn't have enough to say. <laughs> uh, uh, so, uh, I was wondering whether Korea is really slowing down. Uh, because one thing that, uh, if, if GDP were measured properly, so you may remember that uh, President Sarkozy of France asked a number of eminent economists to speak on how GDP is measured and how perhaps it should be measured differently. And they brought in Joseph Stiglitz and Amartya Sen and other uh, prominent economists, and they wrote up a report. And I, I read the report, and the, the down, bottom line I get from it is that, well, there's a, there's a standard way to compute GDP but then there are so many issues that uh, they couldn't, they didn't answer President Sarkozy. They didn't come up and say, no, you should change the way you do GDP. Because the issues were so fuzzy. Uh, and they, they could think of a lot of changes and they didn't have a bottom line. So that's why I'm wondering, is Korea really faltering? I'm, I'm thinking that it, it has been successful for so long uh, and uh, the, the high investment share, the high uh, education share. Uh, 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 another thing about, about that paper is that the, um, the, you looked at data on exports as a fraction of GDP, and I kept noticing that Netherlands was at the top. Well, that's because it's a small country, and you, it has to be that way. And similarly, Korea has to if it's got to have a high export share uh, to be normal. Um, I was surprised about the opening of North Korea. Have I missed something? <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll stop with that. Let me, let me try to provide something useful to this discussion. And I guess I have about six or seven observations. Um, so observation number one, which, which I think is actually worth thinking about, is this was a session about growth bottlenecks and long-term growth and growth models. But at least three of the five uh, people on the panel are monetary people. Um, and arguably, Professor Schiller uh, counts as, as, as financial more than long-term real side growth issues. and. That's just the way it worked out, and it makes for an interesting discussion. But we have to, to raise the question, besides Professor Hua, what would happen if we had a long-term growth theorist from Europe and a long-term growth theorist from Korea, and I was, instead of me, I was uh, Darren Asimoglu or somebody like that? Would there be a different perspective? Um, and I think the answer is yes, somewhat. Um, earlier today, I forget who it was, someone made reference to Danny Roderick's excellent book 
about the many pathways to growth. And I think what we found is that the, despite the reality of the East Asian miracle, um, that things, it is not a cookbook recipe that you do high savings, high investment, high net exports, whoops, you're done, everything's good. Um, there's a lot of institutional conditionality there. And as much as we look on Korea and Japan as having had relatively similar paths, and I think arguably they did, more so than almost any other countries, um, that these paths were not entirely smooth. There, was, there, is, there are arguments about, as was mentioned by Dr. Moon, there are arguments about uh, capital deepening versus productivity-led growth. There are questions about distribution. There are questions about stability. So I think it's, it's worth us not throwing up our hands and saying we know nothing. Of course, we, we've learned something. But I think there, there we should be a little cautious about talking in terms of there is this set pattern of successful growth. And it is about exports. And it is about high investment. It, it's, these are not absolutely necessary. Um, which leads to the second point, which is in response to Dr. Mersh's remarks. So the part of the issue, especially for those of us in the central banking community that I used to be part of, is this question of what point do short-term things become long-term lasting issues? At what point is it that we have a financial crisis or a financial disruption and we need to assess what is, it's both a technical issue to difficulty of assessing what is the true trend growth rate of the economy controlling for a housing boom or, or an export boom or now the, the, the bust that follows one of those booms. How do you decide as a policymaker, as a macro policymaker, what is the right trend? And again, I think we have to ask ourselves a certain amount of judgment. I, I probably differ a little with Dr. Mersh on my ability to see broken legs as blessings. But um, I do think that there is a fair point to be made that you have to use a certain amount of, we would say in German, you know, Sechel. You have to use a certain amount of judgment. You can't just use the statistics and you can't just use what's happened recently. And this was, particularly in the case of Japan, was a repeated source of mistakes that in the 80s, there was this belief that, oh, we're growing at a very high rate, not quite as high as we used to, that's good, rather than recognizing that was probably unsustainable for a Japan that was as rich as it was by 1985. But similarly, there was a problem in the 90s when you had a few years in a row of bad performance, and the Bank of Japan and some other policymakers decided that was the new normal, and you couldn't do any better than that. And so I think where I would agree with, with Dr. Mersh is you have to actually step back and unbundle it and say, what are the fundamentals? You can't just look at the big growth numbers. The third issue, then, is the question of how one marshals, how one gathers and puts into force the, the kinds of resources that a China has. And that's, that's where Professor Hua, of course, comes in with his very long-term perspective. And he raised the issue of the middle income trap, which is a concept that's come and gone more recently. Um, it got a lot of attention because of a paper by Barry Eichengreen and a Korean co-author whose name I apologize, I forget at the moment. Um, but there's been a lot of discussion, loose discussion of late, about is China in some sort of middle income trap? And for those of you who haven't heard this term, it, it, the middle income trap is the idea that you get to a certain level of GDP per capita, which seems to be estimated around $13,000 per, per year. And at that point, abruptly, your potential growth rate slows down. And people point to what happened in Taiwan, in Japan, and Korea. Now, at the Peterson Institute, on this issue, it so happens we've had a number of people look at this, and, and we come to a very different conclusion, at least as far as China is concerned. 
So first, I have a colleague, Arvind Subramanian, who does a lot of growth economics. And he's gone through the cross-sectional econometrics, and he finds that the, there is no evidence of a middle income trap to begin with. That there is, of course, as I referenced this morning, convergence, that there's less low-hanging fruit once you've urbanized and once you've got your workforce in the, in, the, in the formal sector and once you're having to advance technology rather than just implement it. But that's a long, steady asymptoting process. It's not an abrupt shutdown. And Arvind just finds no evidence for this in the data, and I think others have found that as well. A second perspective is that given by um, Nicholas Lardy, my colleague who does a lot of work on, very good work on the Chinese economy. And he and a younger colleague, Nicholas Borst, have done a couple papers looking at the shift to consumption possible in China. And here I agree with some things in both Professor Hua and, and Dr. Moon's papers, that there is a lot of room in China for you to cut back on investment and still have growth. And I think it, it, is, it is important, they, the, Nick and Nick, Borston and, and Lardy, have looked carefully at, for example, the Taiwanese case. And in Taiwan, there was a point at which there was an explicit government attempt to shift out of heavy investment more into consumption goods. And while growth slowed, it was not a huge step down. It was a smooth process. It was a reasonable process. And, if, and you can say, well, why is Taiwan relevant for China? But the fact is that Taiwan was a economy on a constricted political economic path that made this adjustment. And for many of the reasons that were brought up by Professor, by, excuse me, Dr. Moon, Professor Moon as well, sorry, Professor Moon, um, that uh, China actually has more room to do this than, say, a Taiwan or a small economy. So that, I guess, leads to my next point, which is Dr. Moon's, oh yeah, sorry, there's a third reason we, a number of us, don't believe the middle income trap story for China. And that's mine, which is sort of more simple-minded statement of something Dr. Moon said, which is you have a China, as all of you well know, where there's still a vastly underdeveloped urban area, uh, rural area, and where there are hundred, literally hundreds of millions of people. And then there are people of migrant workers within China who are in the essentially informal sector, not having, what's it called, the hookah, the, 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 the right to work permit we haven't fully urbanized and industrialized China yet. And that is something, and you have a much greater, as was shown, a much greater income disparity within China than many of the previous East Asian tigers. And all that tells you that just as I speak about convergence between countries, going back to something Bob Schiller said, you know, it, it's where you draw the border in some sense is an arbitrary data distinction. We can also think about convergence within China. And we are seeing some of that where the production facilities and the good jobs are moving inland bit by bit from the coast and the services and the high value added jobs are here in Shanghai and production moves inland. And there is still a frontier out there <coughs> to be capitalized on. And so that gives another length for China, it seems to me, to continue growing. That's 10 minutes, I think. So let me go ahead for another two to three. Um, I have five, but I'll do two to three. Um, so that brings us, in a sense, back to, to Dr. Professor Moon's paper, which I think is, is, is very interesting as well. Um, I, I must admit, I disagree a little bit with the reference to Korea as a small country in two senses. First, it's not small, okay? There are, I believe, 50 countries in the world with a population of one million or less. Korea is not small. There are a bunch of members of the European Union that have populations of under 10 million. Korea is not small. <laughs> it's not China. Nobody's China, but China. But it's not small. Um, and that's good, OK? Fine, we like to have more Koreans, that's good. And someday it will be even bigger when, God willing, there is unification of North and South Korea. And then there really will be a frontier for Korea to develop internally. And so this goes back to the 
joking aside, this goes back to the point I was trying to make about different path. To me, the argument for Korea having to sustain lower consumption, higher investment, higher exports is not because it's too small to have a domestic market. It's not because countries can't do it. It is specifically that the South Korean people, to their credit, are trying to put away money for the day when there is unification of North and South Korea. And again, people here in China may not like my saying that, but I have to say that. And so even if it's just a risk, they have to put money away against that day. And that's something that our friends in Germany had to experience with their unification with Eastern Germany. And so that, to me, is the reason Korea has to export. It's not a growth model question. And, and so we should try to disentangle that. So let me turn to the final point. Um, one thing which Dr. Moon said in the end, and which sort of came in a different way in, in Professor Schiller's remarks, is the idea that you know where you draw the border again, where you draw the border is, is somewhat not arbitrary, but but is subject to change. So if you have an integrated European Union, as Dr. Mersch has has helped to build. Um, then the border is less meaningful. You have labor supply and markets that are elastic in a way that you don't otherwise have. Now, Dr. Moon, has, in his paper, if I understood correctly, was emphasizing, in the end, East Asian regionalism. And our host, Professor Sun, had spoken about the model of the European, the European integration, I believe, at the start of the session. Um, and that is one way to go. But I think if, if we're really going to talk growth models and, and human welfare, the biggest thing we have to think about, and this is a burden as much on the US as anyone else, is we need to think about migration. We need to think about globalization of labor markets. And when we look at sources of growth, sources of efficiency gains, as well as human welfare, that is probably the single biggest thing that we can do in terms of internationalization. And we're going to see that now in the European Union if the people who are underemployed and unemployed in Greece and Portugal and Spain can move north. That is the biggest thing that can happen in Europe. If we can have a world in which the people of the Philippines continue to have millions of their people around the world sending remittances home, that's a huge thing for the Philippines. And for example, in the US, if we can start importing doctors from Korea and Singapore and nurses from Thailand and surgeons from India, where we are already wasting so much on health care, as I've already mentioned, that's the biggest gain we could have. So just when we think about models, I, I, I perhaps am out of the box in a different way than the very creative Professor Schiller. But when we think about where we want to get past the growth models, I would suggest migration and thinking about borders there would be the best place to start. Thank you very much.